Good afternoon, or good evening, or good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the first virtual alumni reunion after our virtual gala dinner, the speeches that you would have heard had you attended them. Um, the, plan, it, it, the plan for this afternoon is shortly that um, I'm going to introduce Antonia Apple to you who's the Director of, of Communications and Office Manager in the Deanery, to speak on behalf of Professor Martin Vela, who unfortunately is outside Wi-Fi contact of us today. She will be followed by two videos relating to the students and graduates' view of this. Uh, videos, they're short, but I think they're really an interest, give you an interesting insight into what goes on at WITS and what the expectations are. I then have the privilege to introduce uh, Professor Shabir Mahdi uh, to you, um, and uh, he will be able to talk to you on any matter and of interest that is to him and that he thinks might be of interest to us. Um, if there are any questions, there's a little box called QA. If you would like to put your questions into that box, and then after his speech, I will, I will go through those questions. If, however, you want to chat to one another, um, then please use the chat box uh, for comments. Things that appear in the chat box, won't be we won't be able to answer questions directly from that. So questions and answers into the chat box. And then to end it with, um, I would like to say a few words about uh, the Health Graduates Association, the activities that we've had, and uh, any plans that we, might, that we have for the coming years. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Antonia, who's kindly agreed to read some comments that Martin has, has sent to her by email, I think, where he managed to find some sort of Wi-Fi connection. And Antonia, over to you. Thanks very much, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful that we connect in, in this way. Um, you know, these events usually take place in person, but uh, COVID has, has forced us to use alternative means of engagement. Um, so I think the Dean's, the Dean's speech is also quite appropriate in that regard, given that it is going to be delivered virtually. So. Good afternoon, esteemed alumni and friends. I'm sorry that I cannot be there to address you all personally today. Technology, whilst incredibly advanced, has been unable to permeate the vastness of the Kruger Park, and I have therefore been rendered connectionless for the duration of the week. Nevertheless, it is a privilege to be able to greet you all today in what is certainly a faculty first. The COVID-19 pandemic, although devastating, has allowed for the development of exciting and innovative means of engagement. Zoom webinars, team meetings and the like, all form part of the now new post-COVID lexicon, and for good reason. It is my view that through these media, we have the opportunity to engage with an even wider audience. As I indicated in my opening remarks at the AJ Arnstein lecture a few days ago, diaspora alumni from all over the globe can now collectively share in the achievements of the faculty and on demand. Going forward, and given the success of events like the Honors Team Lecture, the Biennial Research Day, and the Alumni Symposium, we will rely on the expertise of the organizing committee in considering a hybrid approach to future alumni events and activities. With that being said, I wish to thank Dr. Paul Davis, President of the Health Graduates Association and his team for their commitment in ensuring that Alumni Week 2020 takes place despite the circumstances. Thank you once again for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the engagement with Dean Elect, Professor Shabir Mahdi. So, Paul, I'm now going to just go straight ahead into the videos. Sure. Thanks, Antonio. My name is Pavesh Khanna and I'm a professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences here at Wits University. My name is Mutabel Khora, a medical student in Faculty of Health Sciences at Wits University. My name is Oradila Mkheti and I'm an epidemiologist. I'm a 2015 graduate of the School of Public Health at the University of the Wits Fontaine. 
Social Sciences for Applied Science focusing on research and scientific knowledge of women's health, health as in mental, social, and physical well-being. It entails prevention, screening, management, and research around the causative agent that can impair women's health. The field also gives you a privilege to help and assist people at their most vulnerable state. As a child, I grew up as a curious individual wanting to know how things worked. Diseases had a profound effect on me, particularly tuberculosis, as I lost a number of people who were close to me to this disease. And when I entered university, I wanted to do something to help people who had tuberculosis. So I did an undergraduate degree in the science, and eventually this culminated in a PhD with a specific focus on tuberculosis research. When I was in grade seven, I fell out of a tree and I broke several bones of my arm and that required surgery. Three months later after surgery and therapy, my hand regained function. The whole process caught my interest, how everything came together. And from then I dedicated myself in giving a hand in improving people's lives from a front line. So we have our MBBCH program where you study to be a medical doctor or a specialist. In addition to this, we have a variety of other programs such as our Bachelor of Health Sciences with subdisciplines in biokinetics, biomedical sciences, and also a subdiscipline in health systems. We also have programs where you can study dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, occupational health therapy, oral hygiene, and even programs where you can study to become a healthcare worker. There are many, many careers that you can follow in the health sciences field. Some examples are biokinetics, biomedical sciences, dentistry, forensic sciences, bioethics and health law, epidemiology, nursing, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and many more. First off, you need to do very well in school. You need to have good marks for your languages, for maths, for science, I mean, either life sciences or physical sciences. A natural aptitude for biology is a useful thing to have also. I've had a wonderful career in tuberculosis research, which has taken me to many different countries around the world. I've met wonderful and inspiring people who have guided me and turned me into the person that I am today. Since completing my health sciences degree at WITS, I've been working as an epidemiologist. I analyze HIV data, reporting on the distribution of HIV in a defined population. This helps target where interventions of this disease are most needed in this country. as to the man and his philosophy that will lead the Faculty of Health Sciences, which has for most of us been the foundation stone of our interests, our livelihoods, and our passions. If there are any questions for Shabir, please put them in the QA box at the bottom of your screen, and I will go through them at the end of the meeting. Shabir, the floor is yours. Uh, so thank you very much, Paul, and good day to everyone who's taken the time for joining us what is afternoon right now in South Africa, obviously. Uh, so first I would like to start off just by, just by thanking Antonia for, to make this webinar possible, uh, as well as to Paul for his continuous leadership of the Health Graduates Association. Uh, so Paul has sort of already done in, an introduction in terms of my background, but I'm just going to take the opportunity of firstly correcting him on one component of it, uh, because it's extremely subjective as to whether I am the voice of reason or not when it comes to COVID-19. Seemingly, if you ask the Minister, Ministry of Health, they would seem to disagree. 
uh, that I had the Glenda Gray on myself for voices of reason, and probably the reason why they kicked us off the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Uh, but we don't, there's no uh, hard feelings around that. It's actually given us an opportunity of probably being much more involved in what we really consider to be our expertise, and that is to really promote the research agenda uh, so that we can contribute in some way or another in terms of bringing this uh, once in a lifetime pandemic to an end. And I'll speak a little to that. Uh, so it's for me, it's a real privilege to be taking on the deanship of this particular faculty. Uh, certainly when I completed my undergraduate uh, studies in 1990, uh, the furthest thing from my mind was ever that I was going to become the Dean of the University of the Barters Run and follow in the footsteps of giants like Raymond Dodd or Philip Tobias. Uh, that certainly didn't feature on my radar at all. In fact, as a student, the only recognition I ever got from this university was in second year, when I was served a letter of final warning and I faced expulsion if I were, if I were ever to repeat the offense that I was found guilty of. And that was stoning uh, the cops that had invaded the campus, uh, at main campus. And as a punishment, I needed to forfeit about half of my savings in my savings account, which at that time were total about 100 rands. I needed to give 50 rand over to the university uh, as a penalty for my, for my engaging in what was considered to be deviant behavior. Uh, so my background as a medical student was one of which my wife uh, indicates that she hardly ever saw me in the same class as her, despite us being in the same year. Uh, because I spent much of my, uh, under my first two to three years uh, in the Black Students Committee Office, uh, where what was really important to us at that stage, uh, being a minority in terms of the student population at the university at that point, where I think in my class, uh, people of color probably made up about 20% of, uh, of all of the students, uh, we obviously were faced with challenges. And one of the challenges is what Paul actually alluded to, in that although the university had moved from Hillbrow to Hospital Hill, the reality when I was uh, during my cl clinical training was black students were still not allowed at what was then known as the Johannesburg General Hospital. And in fact, one of my contributions as a medical student was to basically get a black students committee to lead a march through Hospital Street, uh, insisting that black students be allowed to at least have part of the training at the hospital. And the reason why that was important was not so much just because we wanted to be at the Job of Gen, which was obviously the best resource hospital in the country, but it was undermining the education, the health education of black students. It was undermining it in so far as, as we know, all of the leading professors at that time uh, were all based at the Job of Gen. And in fact, the only professor of any department that was outside of the Job of Gen was probably Prof. Petiful and the rest of the leading professors. So black students were being compromised in terms of the quality of education that they were re receiving at, uh, at the university itself. Anyway, things have changed tremendously. Uh, what we face with right now is that 80% of the undergraduate class are people of color. And whilst people might consider that as having happened because of us compromising on uh, entry criteria, which we need to accept. We needed to make some compromises in terms of entry criteria into the university to be able to redress uh, injustices of past, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we've compromised on the quality of education. And I think that's really important. And I'll speak a little bit about that as well. So where do we stand at this? Uh, so we can pride ourselves that despite all of the challenges that this country has faced, despite all of the challenges the university has faced, uh, the Wits University can count itself to be either number one or number two in Africa in terms of the leading universities, depending which uh, ranking you look at, it's either Wits or the University of Cape Town that are the leading institu academic institutions on the continent. And in fact, we're in the top two to 300 institutions globally. And that is a major achievement for an institution in a country such as South Africa, where we've got huge restrictions in terms of availability of resources, to be able to compete with the best in the world is a major, major achievement. And the achievement at WITS, certainly without any doubt, wouldn't be possible without the Faculty of Health Sciences. The Faculty of Health Sciences simply contributes to a large a disproportionate percentage of the output 
be it publication wise, be it uh, graduate students, be it postgraduate students, a huge disproportionate number of those outputs at the university, in fact, comes from the Faculty of Health Sciences. Now, what makes the Faculty of Health Sciences so competitive is really the legacy that we're able to build on. So my personal example, uh, my, uh, when I finished my training in 1996 as a pediatrician, uh, all of a sudden, fortu very fortuitously, completely by uh, accident, I was offered the opportunity of applying for a position uh, which, uh, with Prof. Keith Klugman, which some of you might know. And Keith at that stage was the director of the South African Institute for Medical Research, and he was about to embark on the largest vaccine study ever to be undertaken in Africa, and that was a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. But Keith was not a pioneer when it came to pneumococcus. In fact, the legacy of development of pneumococcal vaccine in South Africa dates back to the, 90, the early 1900s. The South African Institute for Medical Research was actually started by the mining houses. And the reason for starting it was to address what was being experienced at that stage, where a large percentage of healthy adults that came to the mines succumbed to pneumococcal disease within the first few months of arriving at the mines. And then they decided something needs to be done. And that, uh, at that stage, what happened is uh, almost right, right from the UK came across and did the first vaccine study ever globally in, in South Africa, in the mines, which was our whole cell vaccine. Subsequent to that, there's been a number of other individuals that have been involved in the field of pneumococcal vaccine. And most of you should probably know, what, and he was probably either one of your peers or certainly a tutor to you, was Prof. Prof. Kornow. And Prof. Kornow, during the 1970s, again, very much involved in terms of development of pneumococcal vaccines, as well as uh, w the work that he did uh, with regard to antimicrobial resistance. And Keith was really a graduate of Prof. Kornov, uh, with Prof. Kornov being his mentor. So I basically came along in this line of uh, giants in the field of pneumococcal research and had this opportunity of being mentored by Keith, uh, where I joined him for the vaccine study and subsequently completed my PhD uh, with, in relation to the work that we did on the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in South Africa. Uh, it was the vaccine. Now, for those of you that might not really have too much of an interest in pneumococcus, uh, when we were doing this vaccine study in the mid-1990s, pneumococcus used to kill roughly 850,000 children each year under the age of five and probably the same number of, uh, of adults. Uh, and as you might know, it was known as a captain of the man of death, the captain of the man of death, uh, meaning that many old people had succumbed eventually to pneumonia, succumbed because of pneumococcus. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as sexy as HIV, as tuberculosis in the mid-1990s in South Africa to be involved in a field of pneumococcus, despite it being a leading cause of death in South Africa, to, as well as uh, globally, both in children as well as in adults. So where do we stand right now? We're building on that and building on a huge amount of other research in the field of vaccinology, including research by Prof. Gear with regard to polio vaccine in the 1990s. And more recently, as you heard from one of the people on the, on the earlier video, Prof. Prof. Babesh Khanna in terms of tuberculosis research and basic science research around tuberculosis. And then we've got other notable individuals such as Prof. Lynn Morris, uh, who is amongst the top 1% of researchers globally in terms of citations, who has been leading the field when it comes to development of monoclonal antibodies against HIV. It is this sort of people that makes that's what it is. And that is a leading institution on the continent and an internationally recognized institution globally. Now, the research output in the faculty over the past five to 10 years has really increased. But over the past two to three years, unfortunately, it has plateaued. And whether it's plateaued because we've reached some level of saturation or whether it's plateaued because we're not getting enough uh, younger researchers into the pipeline to become leaders in their own right is something that's up for debate. But what we need to do is we need to reflect on what our expertise is and how does that expertise actually lend itself to the type of healthcare person that we're wanting to train for this century? And in fact, for the next decade, I wouldn't even call it the century. Because what COVID-19 has really done for us is that it's really accelerated what probably should have happened 
almost a few years ago, including in a country such as South Africa, in terms of what our focus should be, in terms of how we go about doing research, in terms of how we go about training of undergraduate students. So we've been forced, as an example with this webinar, to start adopting most recent technology to reach out to individuals, without which we simply wouldn't have been able to do in person, because we we're not unable to do it in person. And this is probably overdue for all intents and purposes. We cannot expect uh, alumni, as an example, to fly a thousand miles, two thousand miles, uh, even if it might uh, get them some flying, mi some uh, flying miles. We cannot expect them to be making these trips to South Africa for us to keep in touch with them. And it's not just people uh, outside of South Africa, it's also people from within South Africa. So we need to rethink, and this is really the start of that sort of rethinking in terms of how we engage with alumni moving forward using the latest technology. But it also allow, forces us to rethink how we go about uh, our training, about in terms of the curricula, in terms of the content of the curricula, as well as in terms of the modalities that we use to actually reach out to undergraduate students, to reach out to postgraduate students, to be able to offer them the opportunity of being able to leverage from the best teachers that there are globally, that have previously trained at this. So what I'm talking about is moving away from the notion that lectures need to be given in lecture theaters. That's an outdated concept. Uh, it probably became outdated in early part of 2000. And we're sitting in the year 2020 and we're still engaging in classroom lectures. Uh, the entire model, internationally exchange, where the teaching takes place outside of a classroom, the teaching place takes place through virtual platforms, uh, be it webinars, be it uh, lectures that have been recorded, and that's made available to students. What students, when students are expected to come to the varsity, is not to go through these lectures, but it's rather to come to ask for clarity on the lectures that they have been posted. It's the opportunity, that one hour of lecture time, needs to be used not, to, not as a dialogue with students, but rather where students come prepared for that lecture and then the lecturers are available in terms of engaging what, uh, on the principles around that particular topic as well as engaging in terms of providing clarity where, where it's required. And this sort of a model where we're blending the use of technology with in-person training for me, it's really important in the context of what we face with regard to the type of students with, that we get into our faculty. As I mentioned right at the start, the reality for our faculty, the reality for South Africa, is that we need to redress injustices of the past. And that includes being able to provide opportunities for students that are coming from very low socioeconomic conditions. But we expect students that are coming from low, low socioeconomic conditions that have got really, really a tough, that goes through a really tough journey in terms of getting basic education and to expect them to be able to succeed at university and go through university without any sort of hindrance is unrealistic. And what we need to ask ourselves is how can we use the technology to really democratize the process of educating students? And that is for me one of the greatest values of the fourth industrial revolution when it comes to training of undergraduates as well as postgraduates. It provides you an opportunity to democratize the type of, the type of opportunities that students have in terms of uh, who teaches them, the content that they're exposed to, and the opportunity that they have in terms of being able to learn at their own speed rather than needing to uh, keep up with the brightest in the class who, of, who usually end up coming from very privileged uh, sort of circumstances, circumstances. So another major issue that we need to ask in this faculty, as I mentioned, is not just about how we go about teaching students, but as well as what do we teach them. And for all intents and purposes, when I, before I applied for the deanship, uh, I, I sort of uh, reached out to a few first year medical students, third year, fourth year medical students, just to gauge from them as to how much has the content changed since the time I, joined, I started my undergraduate training in the 1980s. And I was completely astounded that the content, or at least the key content, hasn't actually changed much since the mid-1980s. And that is a problem. Uh, and the problem that it results in is exactly one of the challenges that we face currently with COVID-19. 
And I think this COVID-19 pandemic has unmasked the deficiencies in terms of our training. And what are the deficiencies that I'm talking about? So when we talk, when we're training students, we're training students for different purposes, be it undergraduate as well as postgraduate uh, students. The priority for a country is to be able to train students that are equipped to provide adequate healthcare services to South Africans. That is our priority and that is the priority of the university. But we will be lagging behind and we will be doing an injustice to future generations of students if we don't invest equally in terms of ensuring that at least a handful of students go through the process and are adequately stimulated to embark on careers in research. And the only way to do that is to inculcate a sense of what research is about and to create that excitement, a passion for research, at least in a handful of students at the undergraduate level. In the past, that happened to some extent because of the type of mentorship that people such as Prof. Philip Tobias uh, showed for people that decided to take off in third year and do a BSc. Uh, but that sort of legacy has sort of fallen apart or has sort of fallen on the wayside. And we need to try to figure out how to actually regenerate, re reignite that sort of passion that students actually see it as an attractive option to take off in third year. Uh, for those that start off in medical school in the first year, to take off in third year, spend one year in one of the major research uh, entities that are currently existing at a university, get a BSc degree, or even get a master's degree if they're coming in through the GEM program before they complete their medical training. And then it also speaks to the issue of the type of research that we expose students. So South Africa, as you might know, are pretty much leading amongst the leaders in terms of the clinical development of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, so we're doing two studies, uh, phase two studies currently in South Africa, the only country in the whole of Africa that's doing studies on COVID-19 vaccines at this point in time. But our entry in terms of that research pathway really comes at a relatively late stage. It comes at a stage where these vaccines have already been developed in other settings and then they arrive to go into human trials. And that's where our expertise exists currently. And that comes with problems. And one of the major problems that it comes to it is that even if our studies in South Africa are shown to be successful in preventing COVID-19, there's no security that South Africans will actually gain access to COVID-19 vaccines as, uh, in, even in the first two quarters of next year. And the reason for that is that in the country, there's absolutely zero capacity and capability to produce vaccines which wasn't the case. In the early 1990s, unfortunately, uh, the ANC government decided to actually dismantle whatever ma vaccine manufacturing facility existed. South Africa used to produce polio vaccine, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis vaccines. Those vaccines were produced in South Africa. And for some reason, it was decided to disband that and they set up a public-private partnership which really hasn't come to the fore up to now. But now, is this only a problem of government? And my answer to that is no, it's not only a problem of government. So right now, there's about 200 COVID vaccines that are at various stages of development. 40 that have gone into human trials, about 160 that are still in preclinical trials. Of those 200 vaccines, not one of those vaccines have been developed in Africa. And that is not because these vaccines can't be developed in Africa. The type of vaccines that have been constructed are fairly simple in terms of their design. But there simply isn't that sort of legacy, that there isn't that sort of research trust to actually develop these vaccines. And these vaccines need to be developed not by pharma, not in industry. That's not where vaccines are developed in the United States. Vaccines in the United States are developed mainly by the NIH. Vaccines in the United States are developed by institutions, academic institutions, and then they pass on the rights in partnership to industry. So this is a failure, not of government. It's a failure of academia in South Africa that we haven't actually created the ground. We haven't nurtured the type of research which is required for us to become competitive more in a basic science field. To some extent, it was, we're fortunate with the likes of Pavesh Khanna, Lynn Morris, when it comes to TB and HIV, they've been able to move us to that position where we're able to do clinical research the uh, vaccine development at an early stage, or at least contribute to it at an early stage. In my own research unit recently, as an example, we now, another focus of ours is Group B strep, uh, where South Africa, more children die in South Africa of Group B strep per capita of the number of live births than in any other country globally for the past 20 years. And recently we've sort of figured out 
how to use the latest technology to assist us in terms of identifying epitopes that are potential vaccine targets. And now we're engaging with the private sector in terms of partnering with them to see how we can develop a vaccine against group B strep. And that is the type of research uh, which we need to start thinking about. We're great when it comes to clinical research. We're great when it comes to translational research. But we need to now move to another level. And that other level means that we need to start refocusing on basic science research, because that is what is going to make us competitive when it comes to be able to uh, ensure security of supply of vaccines and other therapeutics in the future. So I'm not going to take too much else of your time. Uh, it just leaves me to really convey my thanks to the, to the alumni, alumni who have taken the time to actually join. And certainly in the next five years as my term uh, as the dean, I really would welcome the opportunity of you reaching out to me if you do have any sort of ideas in terms of what you think the faculty should be doing or how we can uh, improve things how we can grow the stature of the faculty to make it more than what it is right now which itself is as i mentioned an international recognized faculty and then the only gripe that i've got probably more about antonia's uh, organization of this particular event is that uh, about a week ago, I was invited to a webinar by FNB, and they actually delivered my dinner by Uber, including a bottle of wine, cheese, and everything else. So <laughs> I think there's been a bit of a shortcoming on this webinar in that the dinner hasn't actually been Uber to the attendees. But should we have this in the future, be rest assured if, you, if our prime minister allows for it, we will ensure that you do have your dinner. Uh, by Uber at least. So thank you for joining us and look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you so much, Shabir. Uh, and I quite agree with you about serving dinner. Uh, I think that's an excellent, excellent suggestion. Um, th there were one or two comments and questions, but may I lead with, with the one? I think the most distressing thing for me that COVID has un uncovered is the reliance one has placed on globalization. And now it, it failed us. It, there's no question about that. And now how do we start building up our own self-reliance, uh, particularly on those strategic issues that are of really great importance to us? And vaccine is certainly one of them. And I just wondered, are there any moves to re-engage uh, with the department? Uh, you know, public-private partnerships in this country haven't worked very well in the, most, in the most of it. And I think there may be an opportunity, I suppose, for NGOs uh, to tap into funds for the university and because sometimes it's difficult for the universities to get it. I just wonder what your feelings were about self-reliance. Yeah. So Paul, unfortunately, when it comes to vaccine manufacture, the private-public partnership is an example of what I consider to be a failure. Uh, so for the past 25 years, uh, government has invested uh, with the private sector in BioVac, which is based in the Western Cape. And in that 25 year period, BioVac has not manufactured a vaccine that has gone onto the market. And that is a tremendous failure. And it's all more of a failure when you think, when you reflect that this is not the first pandemic that we're experiencing in the century. In fact, in 2009, there was a swine flu pandemic, which fortunately was less severe. But the learnings from the swine flu pandemic was that again, in fact, with the swine flu pandemic, the pandemic no uh, clinical trials on the vaccines were actually done on the African continent at all, including South Africa. And the only country on the continent to eventually get access to the swine flu vaccine was South Africa. But that happened after the pandemic was over, which is pretty unhelpful. And at that point already, uh, the, 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 the writing was already in the wall that we needed to change course. We needed to ensure that we actually set up systems that would be able to benefit us should we experience the next pandemic. And that a pandemic was going to occur, was, it was hardly a surprise because the history of the past 200 years is that every 30 to 40 years, you have a major pandemic. Everyone was planning for a major pandemic of a novel influenza virus, but it turned out to be SARS-CoV-2 rather. But it doesn't uh, sort of detract from the principles. So yes, apart, now it's not about fund, funding. We're in such a unique situation when it comes to funding that foundations such as the Gates Foundation are willing to invest, provided that there's some uh, guarantee that there's going to be success. 
Right now, the Gates Foundation has provided the Serum Institute of India $100 million, in fact, $200 million, $100 million each for them to set up the facility to produce COVID-19 vaccines. The two vaccines that we evaluate in South Africa, the Gates Foundation are funding that clinical trials, but they're also funding industry in India to set up the manufacturing facilities for them to be able to produce a vaccine should the studies be shown to be efficacious. So money is not a problem. We're not expecting government to actually provide the funds. The private sector needs to provide the funds. Donors such as the Gates Foundation are willing to put money, but they need to have some level of guarantee that this is going to succeed. And that is where we, come, where we need to come in. We need to show that we've got the ability to basically take that leap and, and work on it. But that requires some sort of initial investment. And that initial investment in my mind needs to come, it's not gonna come from government. I think we'll be in the same situation or the next, by the time of the next pandemic, if we expect government to put and make an investment in terms of what is required. That investment needs to come from academia who are usually funded by international funders in terms of the research they do in partnership with the private sector. And that is what probably is missing from the BioVac equation. It's a public private sector that doesn't include academia. And you cannot have a public private sector without academia because academia are basically what are going to provide you with a seed to develop what you actually require eventually. So it's not something that we're going to be able to address in the next 25 weeks, which is what we really need for COVID-19 vaccine. We don't have 25 months uh, to start uh, developing a vaccine. It needs to be done in 25 weeks. And or unfortunately, it's not going to happen. So yes, it, it's short of... Uh, unmask what the dangers of globalization is, uh, but it's something that we, in a sense, have brought upon ourselves by not actually investing where we should invest. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, there's another question I want to ask, but I want to get on to a question that Gillian Rink has asked. Uh, is I think the, her question is, I think the idea of an extended exposure to other institutions or research in third year is great. In the 1970s, I would never have been able to afford the extra year. And there are subsidies, bursary, are there subsidies or bursaries for this purpose now? And is this something the alumni could contribute to? So without question, this is perhaps, to be honest, uh, I mean, I really, um, my greatest interest, my passion is research. Uh, that's what I've done for the past quarter of a century. And for me, the main reason for wanting to take on this Dean Post uh, is really about inculcating a spirit of research which starts off in our, at an undergraduate level. And I can pretty much put my head on a block that within the next five years, there will be funding that will be made available for the high flyers in the class to make it attractive for them to take off a year to actually get involved in research. I agree, and if, thank you. Um, and Paul Kager is saying, he says he can't have a post-dinner talk without dinner. And I agree with you, Paul. How many medical students does WITS have in each year of study? And in 1985, when I graduated, there were approximately 200 in the final year. Yeah, so my best count at the moment, I think is about 350. But in addition to the 350 intake, uh, there's students that are returning from Cuba, and then there's additional students that have done training outside of South Africa that are sort of integrated into the final year. So the number of graduates uh, are more than 350, but the intake is roughly around about 350. Thank you. Um, I just, please, if you've got any questions, please put them into the, the question and answer, uh, answer box. There's quite a lot of on the chat congratulating you, uh, Shabir, on your, on your pending appointment and for, and for your uh, exposition today. Um, the, one of the questions I've, well, I, I, it's a concern that I have is that in my previous life, when I was with the Orem Institute, um, you know, there's no doubt that TB, HIV are epicentered in, in South Africa, not only in Africa, in South Africa. And yet they are not the prime areas of research and discovery in those diseases. And have we let things slip or, you know, are, are, are other universities better equipped to be able to deal with the, with the question. But I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that if there are any postgraduates listening, that we should read, we should take the high ground again, in, in certainly in those two diseases. Yeah, and I think it needs to go beyond those two diseases. I think we also need to appreciate that non-communicable diseases are probably exceeding 
TB and HIV in terms of death in South Africa right now. But certainly TB and HIV are up there. And people like Lynn Morris, people like Vivesh Khanna are very much involved in terms of basic science research. And then we've got a PHRUs, Ian Sunner and others that are involved in the clinical research. But yes, we do lag behind Western Cape as an example, UCT in particular, when it comes to the full portfolio of research around TB and HIV. And it's all about strategy. Uh, UCT does not have much better researchers than, than WITS. The difference is they've got a strategy in place, they've got a model which works, and they've been able to exploit that model to basically promote the institution and to attract additional researchers to that institution. And it's all about strategizing in terms of how we want to position ourselves and how we actually get people within the faculty to actually work together. Uh, so we've got large entities, we've got four or five large research units who hardly ever get around a table. And th this is the responsibility of the postgraduate office. This is a res responsibility of the research office that we bring these people together and flesh out the way in which it's mutually beneficial to everyone, as well as assist the university in terms of providing opportunities for the younger generation of researchers, including undergraduates. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Nope. Well, then it leaves me. Thank you very much, Shabir, for participating in this. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to say a few remarks about the Health Graduates Association and, and what, it's, what it means. But I think the most, and I'm going to end with where you also emphasize, I think that you, we have a huge population of expertise in our alumnus uh, who are not directly associated with the university. But there is and should be an attachment between an alumnus of WITS and where they are and to come back to WITS in some form. It could be advice, it could be in something real, but uh, you know, it, 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 strategically it might be an important type of discussion as to where should we be taking ourselves uh, and getting information from them. And I'm sure there are lots of people who have got lots of opinions about that. Um, so thanks, thanks for that. And I, I would firstly like to also thank um, Antonia Apple for really helping put this whole thing together and making it run as smoothly as it has and dealing with my incompetence, which I really appreciate, uh, on, certainly on the technical level. I really must thank Michelle Groom, who put the, uh, the, uh, the alumni symposium together, and it was an extremely interesting symposium. Uh, I think those, the lectures have been recorded, and I think that there is, it's worth listening particularly in the vaccination area, to Professor van Gelder, who spoke about vaccine hesitancy and where its origins were globally and in, in Africa and South Africa in particular, um, as well as some stuff available to the Adler Museum uh, from those discussions. I'd like to thank David Sepecki from the Adler Museum for putting the Orenstein lecture together and making it the success that it was. And all the other people that have been involved in assisting to make this, I really, I really appreciate it. The Health Graduates program is really to try and recreate something of the flavor of what's going on at WITS um, while, you know, while over the three days that you're here. And we usually start with the Orenstein lecture and Lynn Morris gave a really wonderful exposition uh, in, in her talk um, on, um, uh, equivalent to any of the great talks that we've had in the Orange Sun, just illuminating for me that we talk about vaccine as a, a really strong contender for the lead in therapeutics uh, going forward. And it's just how South Africa is still in that space, not in the space necessarily of manufacture, but certainly in the space of thinking and, and a priori research. The research day was a really interesting day. It gave us a good insight into, into the, what's, what the important workings within the faculty are at a student level, at a postgraduate level, and certainly at a staff level. And I hope that those who didn't manage to listen to it will pick up some of the lectures that, that are available uh, and, and that were recorded. The alumni symposium, I think there were seven or eight really excellent talks about the interests of and passions of various of our alumni and included nurses and physiotherapists 
and uh, um, just gave us a real insight into where people's lives have taken them. Uh, and, and I think it's a great platform that I would like to see grow maybe into a monthly event where, you know, we've got lots of talkative or supposedly talkative um, postgraduates who are always wanting to tell us something and pontificate about something else that I think it would be just a wonderful, a wonderful platform for undergrad, postgrad, I mean, alumni to express themselves and, and, and display their interests uh, that they have. Um, the virtual tours, uh, they're still available and will be for some time. Unfortunately, we couldn't get together the, uh, the, the tour uh, with regard to Sturkfontein as all of every, all the whole group were on some field trip this week. Uh, and so they couldn't put that together. And it's sad that uh, Martin Villa, the, the, the dean, was unable to join us on Wi-Fi because it, it would have been a wonderful opportunity for him to reflect on his term as dean, as dean of the faculty. Um, I just want to, in closing, Shabir and everybody else, assure you that the faculty's health graduates, whatever they are, are all around you and you have their wholehearted support to help in whichever way they can to make your dreams and your aspirations become a reality. Thank you so much, all of you, for taking the time. Oh, hang on, there's another question. I don't know where it's gone. Hold on. Oh, that's... Sorry, I'm... I'm... No, that's it. So mm -hmm. I'd like to once again thank you all. I'm sorry uh, for that, but I'm, if you look in the chat room, there are messages there. And I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and hopefully look forward to seeing more of you in during the course of the year and certainly more at the annual reunion next year thank you so much thank you paul